it is high tech and high stakes. In the murder case against a former Atlanta police officer, both sides offer their versions of what happened in sophisticated animation. 911, what's your emergency? What's your location? Downtown Atlanta. My name is Jeff Taylor. For over 20 years, I've worked with trial lawyers from Alaska to Florida for high stakes legal cases. My team and I use computer animation to recreate client testimony. What you're about to see is based on an actual case. that lines up with the facts of this particular case, uh, I think any judge or jury will look at that. And Jeffrey Taylor says his animation gives life to former Atlanta police officer Ray Bunn's account of the 2002 death of 18-year-old Corey Ward. As a former military officer and expert in federal court, I know the importance of accuracy. What you're about to see is based on an actual case in federal or civil court. This is Karen. We have a new case file that came in, so give me a call when you get a chance. You have one new voice message. So we need you to come in and sign off on that paperwork. Call Karen C. Calling Karen C. Work. Hey. Hey, Karen, it's Jeff. Remember the Atlanta case you were inquiring about a few weeks ago? Yeah, downtown shooting, that police officer case. Yes, well, it just came in and we got the contract. Great, so who's the client? The officer. Interesting, okay. Okay. I'll be there shortly. The Atlanta case was a very sensitive case. It involved two Caucasian police officers and three African-American suspects. Tonight on Animated Evidence, putting the pieces together. The officers received a call from the 911 dispatcher that there were car break-ins in an area of downtown Atlanta. From a distance, they observed three African-American males breaking into vehicles. The two officers arrived in an unmarked car. One officer encountered the suspects and gave chase. Officer Bunn positioned his vehicle in the back of the building in an effort to prevent the suspects from escaping. The suspects ran to an SUV. And attempted to flee the area at a high rate of speed. So when the officers arrived, they saw three individuals breaking the car down in this area. One of the officers took off to the front of the building and the other one went to the rear of the building to pursue the suspects. Before I go on site, I want to read the witness depositions. I want to look at any photographs that were taken of the scene. I want to look at the ballistics reports. I want to make sure that in my mind, I see what the scenario is. So according to the officer's testimony, the vehicle was parked several distance away. The suspects were forced to flee into that vehicle with the officers in pursuit. We arrived on the crime scene. We looked around and first tried to find some key information uh, where, uh, if there were any video cameras that were available that were recording. This happened in this general area. And you can see the uh, tire marks where the vehicle spun out. Right? You got to remember, it's one o'clock in the morning. 
These officers didn't know what the suspects were doing or if they were armed. So the police officers encountered the suspects in this general area. They jumped in the car and they attempted to escape in this general direction. The second officer positioned himself about 100 yards away in order to block the escape of the suspects. The first officer took pursuit of the suspect from the front of the building, and the second officer pursued from the rear of the building to block the escape. Allegedly, these young men were in downtown Atlanta breaking into cars, and one of the officers shot and killed one of these young men. We have all the names and contacts involved in this unfortunate incident. Now it's our turn to take the names and information and piece it together and find out exactly what happened. One dark Georgia night, two men use their vehicle to block a moving SUV driven by an African-American teenager. Corey Ward, age 18, and his friends thought they were targeted for carjacking. The men who did the maneuver to stop Corey's van were not in a police car. Corey tried to get away from people he believed were criminals. We look at the top client testimony and we take those elements, those key elements that are in the testimony and we illustrate those. We have three young black males sitting in an SUV. They're in the parking lot. So allegedly, the teenagers were breaking into cars. The police officers were in plain clothes, but they had badges and they had police markings on their backs. Two undercover officers observed them from across the street. So they drove up and blocked the victim's SUV. And then they drew the weapon. Yes, which of course caused the suspects to try and escape. Jeff Taylor has a unique process of verifying and collecting information through a process of elimination. Every case has last minute information collected. In this case, a possible video of an encounter. So it's me and my team's job to find out what happened. I usually like to start the process of elimination. So let's find out what didn't happen. So we know for sure no weapon was found on the suspects. Was there anything in their hands or on their person that would lead the officers to believe there was a threat? Well, allegedly, the suspects were breaking into cars. So it could have been some sort of tool that looked threatening, crowbar. We're gonna need more eyes and ears on this thing. Let's bring in the rest of the team. Keith is a private investigator that Jeff uses from time to time to collect additional information about cases. Keith is our go-to guy. He knows all the players, he knows specific questions to ask. He knows the right people to go to. I rely heavily upon his research. And when we put the demonstrative animation together, all of that information is taken to the team. We discuss it. We find out what's relevant. We find out what we need to demonstrate. And then we bring it all together and create the final presentation. Every case has last minute information collected. In this case, a possible video of the encounter. And Jeff has an investigator looking into this possible video. information on that case that we've been working on. It's going to be a tough one. Why is that? There's no weapon found, but the officer said that he feared for his life. When they approached them, they ran and jumped into an SUV. So what we do know is according to the testimony of the police officers, they said that the SUV charged toward them at a high rate of speed. Being able to illustrate that is key if that's the basis of being in fear for your life, then 
that is a statute that is used by police departments to use excessive force, which in this case would be firing a weapon. Even Keith was shocked by some of this. They were the first officers to respond to the 911 dispatch. Sounds like they were justified. Let's look at the file again. Were they driving towards them? It looks like the suspects definitely noticed them. We're not here to determine probable cause, but I'm sure we have the facts straight in this case. Right, but the suspects did try to elude the officers, but the officers were in an unmarked car and street clothes. That's true. It looks as though they did identify themselves at some point. Yeah, maybe, but it's dark. And maybe they didn't see the badges. Investigative reporter Mark Linney joins us. Well, Monica Ray Bond's lead defense lawyer, Manny Aurora, said the animation his side is using was actually commissioned by City of Atlanta lawyers representing Bond in a lawsuit over this matter. But he says it clearly depicts what the Bond camp believes the evidence establishes. And we recreate a reasonable uh, simulation of what occurred. Now, if that lines up with the facts of this particular case, uh, I think any judge or jury will look at that. Jeffrey Taylor says his animation gives life to former Atlanta police officer Ray Bunn's account of the 2002 death of 18-year-old Corey Ward. Bunn's been indicted for murder. He said he feared for his life when he shot and killed Ward, who was behind the wheel of an SUV. Are you a murderer? No. No. And I think the uh, question here is, uh, maybe was he in fear for his life? Taylor said his demonstrative forensic animation is based on his interviews with Bunn, GBI ballistic evidence, and more, and in effect can put Bunn's version before the court, even if Bunn, an officer at the time of the shooting but no longer, doesn't take the stand. It depicts his statement of what happened that particular night. Taylor says he's prepared animations for two other police shootings in other states. Now, we've been told the prosecution position is that there's no evidence Bunn was acting in self-defense. His statements have also been an issue. DA Paul Howard talked about alleged inconsistencies between Bunn's various statements and the evidence. Aurora has said shooting situations produce great stress and tunnel vision that explain certain early incorrect statements by Bunn. Reporting live, Mark Winnie, Channel 2 Action News. So what we do know is according to the testimony of the police officers, they said that the SUV charge toward them at a high rate of speed. Being able to illustrate that is key if that's the basis of being in fear for your life then that is a statute that is used by police departments to use excessive force which in this case would be firing a weapon. Ladies and gentlemen this is the actual animation from the case of the state of Georgia versus Raymond S. Bunn. The mock jury is used to pre-test video animation, but does not have any legal bearing on the case. My name is Lauren, I'm juror number one. Well, from what I saw from the animation is um, the officer taking cover behind another vehicle that was um, near the suspect's vehicle in the Jeep. And it appeared to me that they were taking cover because they did not want to uh, come into further contact or further harm from the suspect. So eventually, in the animation, they came out from, from the vehicle to stop the suspect in the Jeep. But then, you know, eventually the Jeep started charging towards the officer. And at that point, it was pretty much at such a fast rate that they had to make a decision as far as what to do. And so, in defense of his own life, he shot at the suspect in the Jeep. After the officer fired his weapon, he lunged out of the way because the car was coming at such a high uh, speed that he didn't have much choice otherwise. Um, you know, well, obviously it's really unfortunate that this happened in the first place, but, you know, and I do feel for the young man who, who was killed, 
during that engagement. But um, personally, I do feel for the officers as well because, you know, in any situation, I feel like anybody would have done the same thing in defense of their own life. And I do feel like, it, obviously, it would have been better if no one had gotten killed, but at the same time, you know, officers have to do what they have to do when it comes to protecting themselves. And I feel like that's what happened during that engagement is the officer was trying to protect himself and, and that was the unfortunate outcome of what happened. I'm John, juror number two. What I saw looked, seemed to be a, uh, a justified shooting. Uh, the police officers were identified on their fronts and their backs. You can see the, the badges on their front of their shirts, mm -hmm. as well as the identifying marks on the back, signifying that they were obviously police. Uh, they pursued what they uh, were, you know, obviously seemed to be a, a car thief ring going on and uh, they were making attempts to uh, apprehend the suspects. When they tried to apprehend the suspects, they, they, uh, they felt their lives were endangered when the suspect was speeding at them and trying to pin them or pin one of the officers between their car and uh, the parked car that they were using for cover. Uh, he jumped out of the way, fired his gun, and and uh, attempted to stop the uh, the the assailants and suspects from uh, fleeing the scene and causing harm to them or others. There was no other good options. If they had let the guy go, you, you never know what harm he could have inflicted on anyone else. If he's willing to uh, you know try to take the life of a police officer, how would you not expect him to not care about anyone else's life as well? When someone is willing to, to do that, you, uh, you, you have to stop them. My name is Elisa and I'm juror number three. My opinion and what I saw in the animation, the officers were in pursuit of suspects that were breaking into vehicles. After further review, I saw that the suspects had jumped into their vehicle and trying to flee the officers who were in full view with their police uniforms and badge, full view. Once the suspects jumped into the vehicle, they started to approach the officers. Uh, the officers had their weapons drawn and the vehicle sped at a high rate of speed towards them. To me, the officers did seem as though they were in fear of their lives and fired the shot at the vehicle to try to stop the threat. You know, what folk don't realize is the officer's human and he's thinking about the suspect and he's also thinking about himself. He wants to go home at night to his family just like everyone else. In a situation like that, the adrenaline's pumping and you're afraid. You're afraid and when you see a 5,000 pound vehicle approach you, that's a threat and you do what you have to do to stop the threat. I'm Chuck and I'm juror number four. My opinion on what I viewed, the, the police officer um, that was in front of the vehicle um, was in line of the vehicle's path and the vehicle was not stopping. So I believe from what I saw that the uh, officer was protecting himself uh, from being hit. Uh, in my opinion, I think he was justified in what he did. Um, from what I could tell, the police officer was um, in front of the vehicle, uh, vehicle's path as it was coming towards him. And the if, if he had not uh, tried to jump out of the way, he would have been hit. And I believe he was justified in his actions and what he did to protect himself. When I, I personally I haven't been in the path of a vehicle charging towards me. I have how in fact been in vehicle and foot pursuits of suspects and have drawn my weapon, um, but did not have to discharge because the suspect didn't, I didn't feel that my life was being threatened at the time. Um, in the video animation that I saw, the vehicle and an officer, when, when they feel that their life is threatened, uh, and it was clear to me when I looked at the video, that the vehicle was headed towards him and would have struck him had he not sidestepped uh, almost into the car that his vehicle itself. Uh, he would have been killed if he hadn't have sidestepped and took action to get the offender off the street. As a former police officer, 
uh, officer safety is one of the main things that we focus on and if a suspect um, that we've encountered poses a threat to an officer uh, we only have a matter of seconds to respond to protect ourselves and the public. Um, you, you asked me if I have encountered something like this. Very similar to this, uh, I was in a vehicle pursuit and a foot pursuit uh, where I uh, ended up in a foot pursuit with a suspect. It was really dark at night. I could barely see. I had a flashlight running through the woods uh, and I was giving commands to the suspect to, to keep his hands up, raise your hands, raise your hands. He never did that um, and I had my weapon drawn, had a flashlight on him. I couldn't see any weapons. He turned around and ran away from me so I holstered my weapon and continue on. However, if he had drew a weapon or, or looked like he was going to point a weapon at me, I would have shot him uh, because I don't know what, he, what, he's, what his intent is, if he's going to kill me or not. So that that's my take on it that police officer in my opinion was justified my name is mark heath wood juror number five well it was an unfortunate situation from what i saw um what the animation showed me is that the police tried to apprehend the suspects and and chasing them they jumped into an suv uh, the officers took cover behind a parked vehicle. Uh, they, they, drew their, they drew their weapons and the SUV pulled out and the officer tried to jump in front of the, the vehicle in order to stop it. But when the vehicle sped up, they jumped out of the way and they fired shots into the side of the vehicle. I, I thought that uh, the officer, once they uh, secured themselves behind the vehicle and drew their weapons, they could have either gotten the vehicle information, called it in, radioed it in for backup, allowed the vehicle to go through and then chased them behind the vehicle in order to keep up with them until the backup came. That could have been an option. Um, I really didn't think it was going to come to shots. Um, you know, it just, it, it didn't seem like it was that kind of situation. And then to find out that they were kids, you know, you know, later, which I know they may not have known that initially, but I'm sure it was a something that they could have seen if they were viewing the suspects going in and out of the cars. Maybe they thought they were teenagers or some kids, but you know, we don't know. We don't have that information, but from what I saw, it looked like the officer did have enough time to either radio it in or fire a warning shot. You know, um, I've, I've never had to go to prison. You know, I've, I've had my run in with the law when I was younger, um, misdemeanor type of uh, activity and also face some felony activity and and fortunately I never had to do actual prison time um, but I know I could have been just like anyone else you know I've had those dumb days when you're a teenager and you're just out there doing nothing and and this, this could have been those kids first time ever doing something like this who knows you know same way we could speculate on how the officer felt i could speculate on that these kids activity this wasn't their normal behavior this just could have been one of those days where they felt like doing something stupid um and you know unfortunately um the officer used the the, the most harshest amount of force that he could use by pulling his weapon and taking the life of one of those kids who uh, made that stupid choice that day. I want to say this to the teenagers out there, to our, to our young people out there. You know, we all know right from wrong. You know, we make choices in our life sometimes that can end our lives. You know, but um, I just want to say to each and every one of you, that ain't the route. That's not what you want to do got to make a better choice, you got to think ahead and you need to surround yourself with people that will push you, put you back on the right path when you're about to make the wrong decision.